Hello everyone, my name is Daniel, and today I'm going to try to answer this question of can we have a rapture on the Feast of New Wine, which is Pentecost, or New Oil, which is Feast of Trumpets, on a year in which there is a forbidden harvest. So let's dig in. All right, so the first question we need to ask uh, is also, is the Jubilee 49 years or 50 years? So I'm also going to address some of the questions with respect to the Dead Sea Scroll and the theories put out by Ken Johnson at BibleFacts.org. So when we seek to understand prophecy, there are many things that are specified in terms of Jubilee periods, and there are two ways in which a Jubilee is interpreted. One, as a period of 49 years with the 50th year, uh, the Jubilee year, overlapping with the first year of the next 49-year Jubilee. And the other is that the first year follows the 50th year. And that has major impacts in how you do it. So this chart here shows um, the two different ways of counting the Jubilee. Now, I follow the traditional Jubilee approach, but of course there are other theories that are based on a 50-year count. So we're going to test that today and see which one of these makes the most sense according to the Bible. There's this YouTube video, which you can get through from the description, which will take you to the Medium post, which will then take you here. And it goes into um, answering the question about the 49 or 50 year. This debate has been going on a long time. It's even documented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this debate goes even before Joshua came. But uh, I'm not going to review all that material because I'm going to make a new case for the 49-year Jubilee. Because um, th that source relied on the Book of Jubilees, which is not scripture. And of course, Ken Johnson has a Dead Sea Scrolls version of Jubilees that uses a 50-year Jubilee. So which one is correct? <clears throat> so let's look at some of the implications uh, if it was a 50-year Jubilee. For example, I've got an interpretation of 70 jubilees from the Jordan River crossing, which aligns with the fall of 2024 being the seventh year of the last Shemitah cycle, uh, and next year should be proclaimed to be a jubilee year. Uh, so 1406 BC plus 70 times 49 takes you to this year, ending spring 2025. And that is when everything in the book of Jeremiah has to be complete, if I understand this correctly. Uh, but if it was 50 years, then that would take us all the way till 2095 for everything in Jeremiah to be completed. So that's a pretty big gap. We've got another 70 years to consider. Um, so here's my proof of the 49-year Jubilee. Many people believe that Ezekiel chapter 40 is identifying a Jubilee year because the head of the year is delayed until the 10th day of the 7th month, Rosh Hashanah. Um, so that's assumed to be a jubilee year. And we know that this was the 14th year after the city was destroyed. This is during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which we know with the accuracy of clay tablets recording the position of the sun, moon, and stars, 21 different positions. So we know that with near certainty. Um, <clears throat> so if that's a jubilee year, and we know that the year that they across the Jordan River, 1406 BC is a Jubilee year, that should be exactly 40, uh, a multiple of the Jubilee apart. And it's the 17th Jubilee if you're using 49 year Jubilees, but it's off by 17 years if you use the 50 year Jubilee. Then, according to my interpretation of Daniel 9.25, a decree to rebuild Jerusalem would go out on the 60th Jubilee, and that is exactly what happened if you use a 49-year jubilee period rather than a 50. So if two jubilees were 100 years instead of 98, then it would be 60 years too early. And of course, I document all that in this video, Five Prophecies and Wonders in Heaven that prove 2024, October 9th, is Judgment Day with the uh, fall of Babylon. 
So Ken Johnson has done extensive study with the Dead Sea Scrolls and recently did a video about three months ago in which he claims points to Messiah's death in 32 AD. Uh, so I believe he's made a slight error in his interpretation when he claims 32 AD is the year of the cross because the text only specifies the week of 26 to 32 AD and not the exact year. So he's taken this Kuman scrolls, which is not scripture, claiming it has a prophecy that points to that particular year, and then claiming it's 32 AD based on that. So here's a link to the 27 minute mark where he goes into that. Um, but this is the text from the scroll. It says, Yahuwah cast their lot amid the portions of Bekezeldek, the new priesthood, Yahshua is from Bekezeldek, who will make them return or repent and will proclaim freedom to them to free them from the debt of all their iniquities, which is what is done on the cross. The parentheses are added. Uh, they're added by Ken. This event will take place in the first week of the Jubilee that occurs after the ninth Jubilee, which he says is 32 AD. And then it goes on to say, now the Day of Atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee, which he says is 75 AD. So the first thing to note is this is an interpretation of Scripture, likely Daniel 9.25, that maps the timeline onto their understandings of Jubilees. So if they knew when the decree of Ezra went out and they added 490 years, they would get approximately 32 AD. Now, now they had a calendar that used 50-year Jubilees, so they mark that on their calendar and then they record it. So this isn't a new prophecy, this is an interpretation of Daniel. That's my, my theory, because they don't really say how they arrived at this date, but it's very easy to see that if we had the Gregorian calendar and we had the, Daniel's prophecy and we knew the Ezra decree, we would say that uh, he's going to come somewhere in the fifth week of A.D., right? 27 to 33 A.D. We could write that down and someone could find it and say, oh, look, they have a prophecy that predicted the exact year he came. But that's nothing more than evidence that we had Daniel and we interpreted it uh, the same way that people interpret it today. So uh, that's my understanding of what this is. And people interpret these Dead Sea Scrolls as if they've got some kind of prophetic insights to give them legitimacy. Like, ooh, they predicted the, when the Messiah would come. But they're not doing anything. Uh, it's not new information. It's not direct revelation. It's not claiming to be direct revelation. Uh, it just means these guys can interpret Scripture. All right, so... Uh, now, I've done uh, a lot of work to prove that it's 31 AD, independent of any calendar. Uh, and you can find that link here. It's also in this video up here uh, in the back half, the last 40 minutes or so, I get into proving 31 AD. Um, so if I plot that on top of Ken's calendar, then we've got the 10th Jubilee, which is 50 years, starting in the year 25 AD, which would have been a Jubilee year. And then the first week of that is right here. Of course, I think the cross is 31. He's saying it's 32, and the text says it could be anywhere in the first week. There's a major problem with this Jubilee reckoning, though, because it would have to place the Jordan River crossing at 1426 BC, a date that is inconsistent with the pharaohs. Uh, there's different pharaohs, and some of the pharaohs are compatible, and some are not. There's actually only one pharaoh that's compatible with the story of Exodus, because the prior pharaoh would have to be alive for 40 years for Moses from a baby until his death, and then the, the following pharaoh would have to have his firstborn son die and not inherit after that. And so there's a number of constraints there, and we know the name of the Pharaoh from other sources. So we know the Pharaoh of Exodus with a high degree of confidence, and 1426 BC is incompatible with that. 
plus we have other sources. I've got two proofs of 1406 BC, one derived from the clay tablets proven the years of Nebuchadnezzar, the other derived from the dating of the first temple and uh, a verse in Kings, which says 480 years before that. So we know this date very well. We're not off by 20 years. Um, so that means if that was the start of a jubilee cycle, then the week of the cross does not line up. So there's a, there's a mismatch. Um, so Ken uses the following dates in the table below here to establish it. Uh, I know it's kind of blurry there, but you can see how he puts the Exodus at um, 1478. Um, and according to him, 2075 and 2025 are jubilee years. I also agree that 2025 is a jubilee year. It just happens that it aligns on 2025. And it also just happens that on this particular year, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar and on the Full Moon calendar are both October 9th. But this is the only year that those things line up like that. All the other years, they don't line up. Um, so that's very interesting. And, and of course, it's not lining up with all the other prophecies with the second order to rebuild and uh, things like that um, don't line up properly. All right. The other thing is we know that Yahshua declared the year of release and debt forgiveness, which is done on the Day of Atonement on the seventh year of a Shemitah cycle. So this is when he went into Nazareth, opened the scroll, read from Isaiah 61, closed right before declaring the day of judgment of our God, and then they tried to drive him off a cliff, just like they do the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. So that we know exactly when he read that. Uh, it had to be on the seventh year. Now, if you look at his timeline here, the seventh year is 32 AD, and that's the year he died. And Day of Atonement's in the fall, and he died in the spring. So there is a clear problem. And it also means, according to this, that he could not have read it any other year in this entire week because it wouldn't have been the seventh year. Um, so we've got more incompatibilities with Scripture. Um, so let's study this a little bit further because I think this can help us answer some questions where people are going, well, I believe they could be going astray about rapture predictions for Pentecost, which if you do in the full moon calendar, happens uh, in five days on the 30th of July, best I can figure. So it says at the end of every seven years, uh, during the last of the seven, that is the sabbatical year, right? That's, you know, all these different verses highlight that. It says, Every seventh year, each of you must free any fellow Hebrews, release of the prisoners, the slaves. Um, after they have served you six years, you must let them go free. Your ancestors, however, did not listen or pay attention to me. That's Jeremiah. Leviticus says, you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years. So the time of seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. There's your jubilee. Then you shall sound the trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, which is the Day of Atonement, and you shall sound the trumpet throughout your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year. So since the Day of Atonement is after Passover, Ken's calendar is, and his 32 AD date is out the window. So is, uh, is the Jubilee year the 49th year? And some people think that the 49th year happens to be the Jubilee instead of the 50th. But that's pretty easy to disprove as well. It says, but in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath, a uh, complete rest for the land. You are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. You are not to reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your unintended vines. So in the seventh year, you're not to take any grapes off of the vine. I'm going to come back to that later. The fiftieth year will be a jubilee for you. You are not to sow the land or reap its aftergrowth or the harvest, the untended vines. So two years in a row, you are not to harvest from your grapevines. So you are to keep my statutes and observe carefully 
uh, my judgments so that you may dwell securely in the land. Then the land will yield its fruit so that you can eat your fill and dwell in safety in the land. Now you may wonder, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not sow or gather produce? He says, I'll send my blessings upon you in the sixth year so that the land will yield a crop sufficient for three years. So while you are sowing in the eighth year, you will be eating from the previous harvest until the ninth year. Uh, and so that's um, evidence that there's two years there, or three years in the case of the Jubilee. Right? You've got the Jubilee year, um, sorry, the seventh year, which is the last commuter year, followed by the Jubilee year, then the year after that you harvest. So that's uh, sufficient for three years. Proves that uh, um, it's not overlapping. So there's there's actually two years or, uh, without any harvesting, without any planting uh, or harvesting, and one year without any harvest. Um, sorry, in the last year you you can sow, but you don't have any harvest from the previous year to get you through. So you need three years to get through it. All right. So let's look at the implications for the rapture and Pentecost. Uh, so many people are looking for the rapture on first fruits and barley, which so they look at for Passover rapture, uh, or Shavuot rapture with the wheat harvest, or the Pentecost rapture at the wine harvest, or the grape harvest, which turns into wine, or Feast of Trumpets, which is the olive, new oil harvest. But on the 49th and 50th year, there is no planting and no harvesting. You're not even allowed to take the grapes off the vines that grow naturally, the aftergrowth. So therefore there can't be any first fruits and therefore there can't be any new wine that year. You're drinking the old wine from the sixth year where they gave you three years worth. So this is further evidence that Ken's calendar is incorrect because the disciples were accused of being drunk on new wine at Pentecost. But new wine is not possible in a seventh year of a Shemitah cycle or the 50th year of a Jubilee. So could this be the origin of Feast of Trumpets moving to Day of Atonement on the seventh year? I think it makes perfectly valid sense if Feast of Trumpets is the Feast of New Oil, but there is no uh, gathering or harvesting that year, then you don't have new oil. So you have no first fruits of new oil and you have no, uh, so you have no reason for the Feast of Trumpets. And of course you blow or shout and declare the Jubilee on the Day of Atonement. So that's the, the beginning of, of the year they move it. Um, so that's, that's my theory on that. So my conclusion is that, uh, Ken Johnson with his Dead Sea Scroll calendar. Now, notice that this is his interpretation of the Dead Sea Scrolls are fundamentally incompatible with Scripture, uh, and nowhere is this more clearly demonstrated than at Passover on the cross, because they always have Passover on the 14th day of the month, on a Tuesday. It's always a Tuesday every single year. Uh, some variations put it on a Wednesday. Um, but he puts it on a Tuesday. And of course, you don't have, you know, you have four plus days and nights from the time he dies to the resurrection when the women find him at the tomb. Uh, and the three days since all this happened on the road to Emmaus, when there's like really five or six days to that, he's not rising on the third day because uh, it's third day from the time he was handed over or killed. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you do a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and it doesn't matter if you do sunset or sunrise start of day. Um, there's just like th three or four days and five nights um, that all add up and it's just incompatible with scripture. So I believe that people have made the Dead Sea Scrolls into an idol and they worship the Essenes because they appear to understand much about the coming Messiah that the Pharisees and the Sadducees missed. So you assume if they got this right, they must have been the true one that actually had all the true information. So their calendar must be correct. But that's a fallacy. Just because they're right about one thing doesn't mean they're right about other things. And um, 
everything that the Essenes taught that was prophetic could be found in the canon. They predicted the year, they put it on their calendar, they wrote it down, we found it. Does that mean their calendar is valid? No more valid than if they had wrote it down on a Gregorian calendar. And of course, the rapture, uh, people are looking at Pentecost for the rapture and that it would be a harvest of first fruits. But on this year, this is the seventh year of a Shemitah cycle, there was no harvesting or pruning or gathering of grapes allowed from the vine. So therefore, there is no new wine to be poured out this year. Uh, and the same thing will be true for a Feast of Trumpets this year. Uh, and it's because it's a Jubilee year next year, Feast of Trumpets gets moved to Day of Atonement. So the earliest that I can see any activity going on would be Day of Atonement, um, which is 12 days before October 9th. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.